Yeah, so, uh, well, thank you for the invitation to come speak today. And uh, as I said, I've, I've got a bit of a confession to make, which is that I, I've, I've somewhat altered the course of this talk. I guess it was some orthogonal thinking right there. And um, I'm going to be presenting in reaction to being misquoted by a colleague last year, and I didn't get around to reading that article until I was preparing for the talk I was going to give, and I suddenly realized I have to restate something I published in 2012, because it was obviously misunderstood. So there we go. So I am going to be talking about space, and I am going to be talking about... Sorry, this is... There we go. I am going to be talking about why archaeologists are quite good at thinking about space, and therefore thinking about spatial cognition. Um, which, of course, is self-evident to those of us who are actually field archaeologists because we're constantly measuring the spatial relations of artifacts before we destroy those spatial relations. And if we do um, field work and survey work, we're also very interested in measuring um, in, with as much um, accuracy as possible the spatial relations between not just artifacts within sites, but sites amongst themselves and sites in relation to features of the landscape. So clearly, um, spatial, spatial cognition should, for us, be a very obvious next step. And several neurophysiologists have suggested that spatial cognition is an excellent window on the mind, that the processes that underpin um, spatial cognition are a very good example of how the human mind works. And of course, um, they're working not just with human subjects, it's worth pointing out that uh, nothing I'm saying is exclusive to humans. So all, all primates, including humans, rats, and various other animals who've been studied, are capable of, of exhibiting many of the aspects of spatial cognition I'm going to talk about. So on the assumption that there are very few neurophysiologists uh, in the room, I'm going to do a little bit of definite <laughs> defining terms before I move on. So let's talk about spatial cognition. What is spatial cognition? Um, of course, it seems fairly intuitive, but it's worth stating. So it's the acquisition, organization, utilization, and revision. It's an important dynamic aspect of this definition of knowledge about spatial environments. In other words, it's how we acquire our knowledge of the environment, the world we live in, how we figure out where we are in that world, how we locate resources, and how we find our way home. And what it is not is conflatable with direct object manipulation. And what that means is we can't simply um, transport or recycle, transfer hypotheses that arise out of thinking about um, material culture and how we manipulate objects and move that to the study of how we move about the world and navigation. Um, these are not really the same processes. So where do we go from here? Um, I think we have to step back and have a look at what our colleagues in neurophysiology have been doing, because over the course of the last few decades, they've been doing quite a lot of refining and um, refining old models of what spatial cognition is, what happens in the brain when we navigate, when we locate. Um, and a lot of that has been, in, as, um, has been as a result of uh, new technologies, uh, neural mapping in particular, neuroimaging. So let's have a look at some of um, essential definitions uh, provided to us by uh, not just geographers, but uh, neurophysiologists uh, regarding spatial cognition. So first of all, I think it's important to realize that there's two essential frames of reference that we use when we engage in spatial cognition. And those are allocentric and egocentric. Again, these are very intuitively understood terms, but it's worth uh, making sure that we have uh, understood them the same way. So, in an allocentric uh, spatial coding system, on the left side of the screen here, uh, we're encoding in the brain object-to-object, -object, location, information. So these are, um, these are data that are going to help us make up an enduring map or representation of the world, which we're going to carry with us in our minds. This is the cognitive map. We also have a frame of reference that's egocentric. And that's self to object. I'm standing before you. I'm standing in front of the screen. Um, if I move from this side of the stage to the other, I'm shifting my egocentric perspective, but the relationship between you and the screen is unmoved. So these are two perspectives that are always going to be used together. And in fact, 
have to be used together in order for us to move about um, and navigate successfully. Um, so let's talk about navigation. How do we move about the world? Basically, three types of navigation. We're not going to look at the first one. Piloting is the, the simplest, um, easiest form of, of, of navigating the world, and it's simply following a beacon. So whether you're following a smell because you're a black lab and something smells juicy over there, or whether you're, you're following a light or a landmark, you're just piloting straight towards a beacon. Um, that's probably the simplest, most primitive form of navigation. What we're interested in today, what I'm really interested in discussing with you today, are the two other forms of navigation, route finding and wayfinding. So in route finding, you're dealing with learned responses to cues in the environment. So it's stimulus response learning. It's a, from a fundamentally egocentric perspective, but not just limited to an egocentric perspective. So what you were doing is memorizing a series of cues in the landscape that provide you cues for action. And that's <coughs> typified in route finding. And it's what most of our GPSs are doing when we turn them on in our vehicles and blindly follow what they tell us to do up that dead end, into that field, over that cliff. <laughs> we're just following the procedures that instead of learning, we're just being di dictated, having dictated to us. Wayfinding is a bit more complex because in wayfinding, we're planning novel routes towards distal goals that may not be visible, um, over land that we may not be familiar with, but that, but, but we're manipulating um, our egocentric data in order to place ourselves in an allocentric perspective on the cognitive map that we have of the world around us and estimate how we can get to that distal goal following a novel route rather than following learned responses. So it's a predominantly allocentric perspective that we're going to be using. We're going to be using direction, speed, and heading, and estimating where on the larger representation of the world we're currently located. So you can see that that's a, that's a slightly more complex way of moving about the landscape than route finding. If you move into a new neighborhood, you're going to have to do a whole bunch of wayfinding because you, don't, you haven't learned the response routes. You haven't learned the routes yet. As soon as you learn the routes, you're going to get into your car, or you're going to get head out the door on your bicycle, or you're going to walk, and you're going to start following a memorized route, and that's going to liberate some cognitive space for thinking about other things. And the next thing you know, you've gotten to work. You can't remember getting there. And that's the difference between route finding and wayfinding. Um, one of the things, again, I, 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 it, it's just always worth, worth pointing this sort of thing out. This isn't something that we do exclusively. It's not something that typifies human, the human mind. There are many other animals who can use all three of the types of navigation. And we know that other primates use all three uh, forms of navigation. And even bumblebees may do some root finding. So recent findings have shown that they appear to respond to linear features in the landscape. They alter their flight plans. So that means that they're learning responses to cues in their environment, probably visual cues. And they're not just randomly bumbling about and then following a beacon back to the hive. So um, even, even insects are capable of uh, at least root finding. I think it's just worth pointing that out. The cognitive map, I've been talking about uh, from an allocentric perspective, how we build up a representation of the world around us. It's called the cognitive map. Um, it's an internal representation that's built up from our direct experience of the world. So this is where we're sort of maybe en piété in French, stepping into the world of phenomenology and thinking about picking up information about the world because we're moving through it. For example, Tim Ingold often talks about how important it is to move into walk, and Tilly also talked about how it's important to walk a landscape in order to embody it and get to know it. Well, that's how we build up cognitive maps. We build them up through collecting information um, in a very motivated and very deliberate way as we move through a landscape. We also use both path integration and landmark recognition. And those are two, um, two spatial skills that I'm going to develop uh, in what follows. We use self-motion 
monitoring our, our motion through the landscape and egocentric signals, both to update the allometric representation, so update the cognitive map, and also to do path integration, which allows us to situate ourselves on that cognitive map. So we have a dual purpose as we move about the landscape. We're collecting information that has, is being used to, for two very different ends. Well, very different, two different ones. Um, I have a little, a little, did I go too far? No, there we go. This is what I was reacting to when I decided to reroute this, when I decided to reroute this talk. And I'm missing a slide. Oh, well. We're going to go straight to the, the heart of the matter then. It's missing a slide on spatial updating. Wynn and Coolidge in 2016 were citing an article I published in 2012 that touched upon the possibility that there were differences in cognitive style and perhaps differences, physical differences in the brains of Neanderthals and modern humans as a result of different lifestyles. And what they state here is that I made a controversial argument that modern humans had an advantage over more archaic forms, they mean hominins, because they integrated both systems, talking about allocentric and egocentric, using egocentric observations to constantly update survey knowledge. Well, first of all, that wasn't the point I was making. And second, second of all, there's nothing controversial about defining spatial updating and path integration as the way that animals relate egocentric sim signals about the world around them to a cognitive map that they hold in their, in their brains um, to tell them where they are in the world. Um, nor, because they go on to say that I don't specify what powers the spatial updating, but a good candidate is executive reasoning or integrated resources of the retrospinal cortex, which is, by the way, possibly true. Um, but this is a difficult hypothesis to test. It's not a difficult hypothesis to test, and the neurophysiologists have been testing it for the last several decades, and they can situate cells in the brain that that allow us to do the spatial updating. So one of the things I wanted to do here was talk a bit about what they are telling us um, underpins spatial updating, to sort of take the poison out of that citation. So uh, I mentioned that, yes, retros the retrospinal, uh, retrospinal cortex um, and its integrated resources may have something to do with spatial updating, but it's a lot more complicated than that. And this is a simplified schematic of the cortical and subcortical connections of the hippocampus and the striatum, which are involved in spatial learning. And you're going to be delighted to say, it's also, by the way, leaving out all the connections to the parietal and prefrontal cortices. You'd be delighted to know that I have no intention of speaking to this slide, but I have something a lot simpler, because what I'm really interested in is what's happening in the hippocampal formation. So I just wanted to make you aware of the fact that spatial cognition is a very complex process and involves many different centers of the brain acting in concert with lots of feedback loops and highly complex uh, situation. The hippocampal formation, which lies deep in the brain, as you see here in red, okay, it's deep-seated, it's a deep structure below the parietal lobe. It involves the hippocampus and the retrospinal cortex, and these are the two parts of the hippocampal formation that I really want to um, discuss because this is where we have identified, or neurophysiologists have identified, cells in the brain that fire when we recognize a landmark, uh, when we move to tell us how, how, what direction we're moving in, what our heading is, um, and how far apart the landmarks we're recognizing are. Okay. So, for, for a long time now, we've known that the hippocampus is the seat of the cognitive map. And there's a, a, a large body of research that underpins that, um, that observation. More recently, um, uh, neuron mapping has shown that there are actually placed cells in the hippocampus. And that's, these are the cells that fire when we recognize a landmark, that help us recognize relevant and irrelevant landmarks as resources, or affordances, if you will. Um, in the entorhinal complex, we also have the grid cells, which are triangular shaped cells, which allow us to triangulate and actually work. It's the metric, it's the metric system that allows us to work out the distances between these places that we recognize. And this is how we're going to build up a cognitive map that has structure that represents 
um, internally, the external structure of the world around us. And there's also the head cells, and the head cells are the ones that give us the direction. So we get representations of orientation and representation of direction, as in direction of travel, because of the presence of these head cells. So the grid and the head cells are involved in path integration. They're monitoring self-motion, they're collecting streams of information from self-motion, and that's going to allow us to update the special, spatial representation. So these functions, these essential functions of cognitive, um, of spatial cognition are located in the hippocampal formation. Of course, we need to, oh, this is just a summary. So let, we, can, we can quickly go over the slide here. I've already spoken to it. Um, of course, as animals, once we develop a map of the world around us, we need to take action, we need to use this information, and that's what happens in the parietal and probably in the prefrontal and other ancillary systems of the brain, where we plan actions and where we communicate with um, the motor, motor reflexes and actually carry them out. Um, Oh, and in the bottom, a little, uh, a little quote by um, Chirsa Burgess. Um, there's not a strict di dichotomy between, I, I couldn't put it in earlier, I needed to be able to explain this first. There's no strict dichotomy between egocentric and allocentric, and I think as you probably already understood, they work together. Okay, the, the two systems, uh, the two perspectives are going, are going to be used together during the course of, of complex navigation. So, now that I've given you the background, I think it's probably time to introduce some of the questions that archaeologists are asking themselves. And one of them is, are there interspecific differences in brain structure between hominid species that would have affected spatial cognition? In other words, do we see um, in the archaeological record or in the paleontological record any reason to believe that anatomically modern humans and Neanderthals may have differed in terms of their spatial cogn uh, cognition? So were, were, were their abilities to navigate different? Um, there is a body of literature out there, um, especially um, the activities of uh, Milo uh, Miliani uh, Brunner and colleagues that, um, who point out that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens have different shaped skulls. The result is they have different shaped endocasts. And um, in the case of uh, the distinction between Neanderthals and modern humans, Brunner suggests that parietal bulging in the modern human brain case will have affected the deep structure of the parietal region and the hippocampal region um, and led to uh, differences in uh, manual ability, in visual spatial integration, and with memory. Hard for me to assess these, uh, I'm not an anatomist, it's hard for me to assess these claims and I'm aware of counterclaims by other uh, paleontologists who feel that uh, there may just have been a displacement of these different organs with its structures within the brain as opposed to a replacement or an enlargement in modern homo. In modern homo. So um, Emmy could be right. There may well have been um, uh, fundamental differences in brain structure in modern humans that are reflected in the endocasts. Um, these, he relates to uh, the production of material culture, manipulation <coughs> skills. Uh, he wrote an article with Lozano, which several of you are probably familiar with, Third Hand for Neanderthal, um, where the use of the teeth, by uh, Neanderthal's use of the teeth, was, was evidence of a different form of proprioception and uh, apprehension of the world and action, um, and interaction with the world around them. But, uh, as I said, there are other explanations um, of the impact of differently shaped skulls uh, on the brain, and I'm not really well placed to assess Emmy's claims, nor had I really thought of brain structure as fundamentally different when I first uh, published my own suggestion. My suggestion arose from reading of the neurophysiological uh, literature, and I'm coming up to it, so we're good. Um, which was highlighting that there are intraspecific differences linked to a training effect. So this is McGuire et al., part of the um, uh, British uh, re uh, team of researchers that's doing quite a bit of research on the hippocampus, and uh, they're pointing out that there's a capacity for plastic change, for changes in the, in the brain structure in healthy adult humans, 
uh, as a response to environmental demands. This is something that's called the training effect, and their initial research, which everybody is is quite aware of, it's, it was uh, well well uh, um, uh, well, docu well uh, c carried by the media. Uh, it was a study of London cab drivers. The London cabbies have enlarged hippocampi relative to other members of the British population, and relative to bus drivers. And why would that be? Bus drivers follow routes. They follow a procedural queue-based route. And they don't have to suddenly switch over and wayfind and try to find novel routes between different, different points in the landscape, unlike the London cabbie. The London cabbie also has to do something, again, this is a, this is a, a largely an imagined British audience, so you, I can say the London cabbie also have, has to have the knowledge, which is this mythical cognitive map that they have to build up of the entire road system of London. Um, so clearly, there's a training effect, and it has affected these individuals, and it has enlarged the hippocampus. So we, we know that's a, that's that's a thing. Video game studies have also shown that um, uh, a very recent study by West et al has shown that um, you can forestall the inevitable decline in cognitive ability and spatial cognition in aging adults by allowing them to train using video games. So they're, they're maintaining a facility with um, virtual navigation that is somehow helping them uh, retain um, uh, function in the hippocampus. And there have also been video game studies that have shown that you can level out uh, differences that, that um, some psychologists have claimed were sex-based differences and or probably just gender differences between male and female uh, navigation outcomes. A quick plug for an article I published in 2012 with colleagues. Uh, we did research with Orienteers, the Scottish Six Day Orienteering Festival in, 20, in 2009 in Tay, and we showed that if you factor out physical differences, so the ability to run fast and rough terrain, uh, men and women who have equivalent training have the same outcomes when they're conducting um, navigation uh, exercises, navigation tasks. So we support. Uh, the suggestion that there's a training effect, that this training effect affects uh, the structure of the brain and it affects the uh, cognitive style that individuals adopt. So what did that do? That put a little bug in my ear. I sort of wondered, in that case, if we think that modern humans and Neanderthals may have had different lifestyles, is it possible that we would have had similar scales of difference between these two populations? to the ones we observe between, say, taxi drivers and bus drivers, or between men and women who don't move about the world in the same way because of gender-based activity patterns. And that was the basis of the 2012 article. What I reasoned was that if we look at the social context of Neanderthals and modern humans, we look at the, what the archaeological record has to tell us about that social context, we do see what appear to be some differences. So both populations are highly mobile. They both show dispersibility, so that's not really a difference. You know, the Neanderthals made it all the way to the Levant and back. Um, they both have a foraging lifestyle, and they both eventually adopt symbolic expression. However, if you look at the types of mobility, and someone two days ago was referencing that, if you look at the types of mobility, it looks like modern humans had a propensity to use three types of mobility, two of which require long distance movements in most environments. And Neanderthals were more likely to restrict themselves to the smaller scale foraging mobility. So foraging mobility is just your day-to-day -day, um, mobility around a campsite as you look for resources and bring them back. Information gathering, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm just concluding. The time up there. Information ga gathering and social network maintenance are two types of mobility that require much longer distance moves that are adaptive in heterogeneous landscapes where there's an element of risk and you want to gather information about nearby environments or faraway environments as a fallback plan should resources fail in your territory. And the social network ma maintenance is a social net, a social security net. Because in times of need, hunters and gatherers will go visit relatives. So the group will break up, people will go see 
friends, families, and relatives, and stay there for a few months to wait over a period of resource um, scarcity before returning to their home range. So the archaeological record tells us that modern humans were adept at using, or tended to adopt these three types of mobility, were adept at using, for example, um, a symbolic expression as a means of building identity and maintaining social links with faraway people. And I think that that means that we had developed dynamic and spatially extensive social networks, which overlay on the cognitive map that Neanderthals were equally capable of building up that we were. What we added was this extra layer of complexity because all of these little colored dots are moving. They're moving in time, they're moving in space. It's a really socially dynamic environment that's being overlaid on an otherwise static cognitive map. And it's placing extra cognitive load on our spatial cognition. So I propose that Neanderthals and modern humans had, had different lifestyles with respect to this social networking, that this would have had an impact or placed extra a cognitive load on their brains. This would have had an impact on their cognitive or uh, navigation style, their cognitive style, potentially on the structure of the brain. And that may lead in the long term to real biological differences, which are entirely speculative. And I have to admit that. So thank you very much for your time. I hope I've shown you that space is not the final frontier. And thank you, Mark, for inviting me here.